You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, hey, Foundry Church, welcome to worship today. As we get going, we're looking at the three years, six days, 15 hours, and one morning of the ministry life of Jesus. And looking through the lens of the Gospel of Luke, we find ourselves today in Luke chapter 10, and we're really going to wrestle with the question of loving neighbor. What does it mean? What does it look like? Um, When you talk about love, there is so many fun kind of aspects to it. You know, as as a dad who who I have two teenagers living in my house and a 10-year-old who is a hopeless romantic, um, I will say this, it is interesting to watch um, these elements of life kind of come to the surface. You know, when when you talk to your your son and you're like, you're going to go to the door, you're going to stick your hand out and you're going to introduce yourself by name, make eye contact, tell him who you are and ask him if you can take his daughter out. And he's like, dad, that's so old fashioned. I'm like, be it so, that's his daughter. And I feel that way because I have a daughter. So you just figured out the rules, right? Because you're going to come look me in the eye and we are going to make eye contact. And if you do anything terrible, you're meeting the person who will greet you at the end of that. Because for me, I think love is one of these things where um, we need to understand the, the depth and power of it, but also look back and say, like, there's some comical history to it as well. I mean, you look in the ancient world, um, in, in today's, you know, day and age, we have like, you know, they're, they're my soulmate, and I just love them. I could, from the moment I met them, right, you just see it, it was like little hearts were bing, 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 popping up off their heads, like I just knew. But in the ancient world, there was like marriage by capture. Like, did you know that was a thing? Like a village with, that didn't have enough girls would go raid another village and take their girls, And then um, the village that was raided would quite often come hunting for their, they wanted their daughters and wives back, so they'd come hunting, but the, the new the new husband, I guess you could call him, would take his captured bride, and they would like go hide in the hills or in the caves and go hide, and um, there's actually a story that um, through the phases of the moon, they would hide and they would drink this, um, this brew that was made um, out of wild honey, and we get the term honeymoon. Mm, doesn't seem as romantic now, does it? Like, you look at that and you're like, well, I don't know if I want a honeymoon as a captured bride, right? Like, it just, you look at this and you understand, like, love has different understandings, interpretations. I mean, it's been Valentine's week, right? We have these expressions of love, different things going on. But today we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 42. And as we do, you're going you're gonna to see some different expressions of love. Check this out. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, Luke says. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Are you getting the kiss up vibe here, right? Like this guy's like, and could you just help me with who's my neighbor, right? He's got another question, who's my neighbor? So Jesus doesn't really indulge him. He tells him a story and he says this. In reply, Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite was coming past the place, and he saw him passed on the other side. So he got far away as he could from the man. But then a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, modern verbiage, he put him in his minivan, right? And brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. By the way, two denarii would have been about 24 days 
worth of lodging at an inn, just the going rate. Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Then we find Jesus at the home of Mary and Martha, and Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, remember that, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. So, like, Mary and Martha are just like our kids, right? They're like, I'm doing all the work. Tell her to help me. But Jesus replies, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So what, what do these two stories have in common? We're actually going to, I think there's a deep link to what is in common between them. I think there's a way for us to understand what is going on between these two stories and what Jesus is doing. And really, I think we can boil it down to this understanding that any cultures, any cultural definition of love always becomes like a religion, not a relationship. So I'll say that again. Any cultural definition of love becomes more of a religious checklist than about relationship. And we all know love has to be about relationship. It can't just be about a checklist. It has to be about relationship. So when culture begins to define love, it start t- starts telling us the rules by which we can play. So, so we look at this and know that these people are living under Martha and, and uh, this, this Pharisee, this re- religious scholar, are living under the cultural assumptions of what they define as loving God, loving neighbor, right? They're living under this. They're creating and living by rules and checklists that inform how they behave instead of behaving in a way that is truly loving. They are living with calculated kindness for social acceptance. Have you ever thought of that? Calculated kindness for social acceptance. I had a hard time wrapping my head around this kind of point that we're making. I was was really wrestling with it. I was talking with Erica, and when she said that, it finally made sense. Calculated kindness, so almost engineered kindness that makes you look good socially. We do it too, don't we? You're at the grocery store. You're checking out, and on the little um, debit or credit card screen, it says, would you like to donate a dollar today to the United Way's Kids Hunger Fund? And you're like, yes, I would. And you want people to see it, and you push that button, and you give to it, not because you necessarily have thought of them before or want to, but it's the right thing to do. It's calculated kindness for social acceptance. If a, if a checkout, a cashier says, would you like to donate the change so you spent, you know, like $75.03 and they're like, would you like to round it up for kids' hunger? Who here is like, no, no, I don't want kids to not be hungry. I want my 97 cents back, right? But we have this calculated kindness for social acceptance. We do this in a, in a oh, just bazillion of different ways. The way we engage like charity and philanthropic giving and different things like that, volunteering, a lot of times what we do is calculate a kindness so that society thinks of us in a certain way. And nobody's going to be like, oh, amen to that. But deep down you're like, oh, amen. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like the way that feels because we live quite often by these checked boxes of what is socially acceptable. But Jesus pushes past them time and again. But what I want to do today is take a minute and look at culture's A-plus students, the the kids who the teachers love. Oh, if you're one of them, bless you for being that. But I did not like you because you made people like me look super bad in life, right? Like you're like the, the teacher would ask a question and your gentle hand would go up and then you'd give the right answer if they called on you, but usually the teacher didn't. They wanted to see if Eric learned. Eric, do you have a thought on this? No. 
I'm not super big on reading words, you know, things like that. Like you have those moments where, oh, these are cultural A students that we're about to talk about. Let's take a look at them and just maybe um, deal with the discomfort. First of all, the rich young ruler, he comes up and he loved the right people his whole life. He had loved the right people his whole life. He had obeyed all the rules to love God according to a rule book and his own scale, right? He had done everything by the letter of the law. He was technically perfect. And just to be sure, he asked the question, so who is my neighbor? This is a really critical kind of aspect because we think, I think, in, in genuine honesty, we think, like, was he asking, like, you know, I really want to make sure I, I, I can get the right person. I don't think it was that humble. I think it was more of not getting extra credit, you know, like he's getting extra credit on the law of God test. I don't think that's what it was. I think he was trying to see, a better version of his question might been, might have been, who don't I have to love? Not, who's my neighbor? Let's define it so I can go find him. It was, who's not my neighbor? Because I, I want to know who I don't have to worry about, who I don't want to, to serve. He, he had an agenda in there. He had something going on in this that um, allowed him to ask a question that if you dig just a little deeper down, there's a heart motive there that betrays maybe a prejudice, a racism, uh, a sense of, of cultural betterness. He's better than other people. So he's saying, who is my neighbor? But if you stripped away the veneer, he's saying, all right, tell me who I don't have to love. Tell me who, who doesn't need my, who, t- just tell me who I don't have to worry about so I can focus on the right people. And Jesus goes into a story. And in this story, there's more of the cultural A students. There's a priest and a Levite. So the easiest way for us in our cultural context to think of it is think of like me. I'm a pastor, so you'd be like a priest, which is funny. I, was, I should have wore a collar, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, I, know, I love how people just laugh openly at that. I could not be a priest. But, um, but you think of the priest, right? So that'd be like a pastor. And then a Levite who is of the priestly line. And that would be more like a lay leader. Like think of our, one of our volunteers on worship this week, and, and they're like a Levite, and some of them are out there like, yeah, I knew I was Levitical. Like, you know, they're, they're a Levite. They're, they're this lay leader who is leading the people of God in worship in some way. They served God, and they knew, where, they knew how and where to love God and how and where to love others. The priest and Levite passed their culture test in Jesus' story, flying colors. They were an A-plus student. But we can cut them some slack because their excuses would have held water in the culture. Think about it. What if the robbers were still, still nearby? What if the robbers were still nearby when the priest and the Levite passed by the man who had been robbed and beaten? Well, isn't it right to protect your family? Isn't it right to make sure that you're not harmed and you get home safely to your family? I mean, I think even we would wrestle with saying, well, yeah, you got to take care of number one first, don't you? Like they could have said that. What if the man were not injured but dead? See, he was bloody, so he would have already been unclean because the flow of blood. But what if he was dead? In the Hebrew law, being, being near a dead person made you ceremonially unclean. And this was a priest and a Levite, right? So they couldn't be unclean. And and in this day and age, in first century Judea, we know this, that even if their shadow passed over a dead animal or a dead person, they were considered unclean. So you can see culturally it would have been right for them to get to the other side of the road and kind of skirt away and not and not get even their shadow on the dead person. Culturally it was okay. According to their culture, they were doing the right things. Their their excuses would have held up under the weight of cultural scrutiny. But Jesus gives us some important details in this story that I think we often overlook, not intentionally, but, but they're there. I'm from a land of elevation. Colorado and California have elevation changes, right? The mountains. This is a mountainous region, and Jesus says it this way. That the man, the priest, and the Levite were coming 
down to Jericho. So in the west of Israel, you have the the Judean hills, the mountains. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level. And they were going down, which means they were going from Jerusalem to Jericho. They were going away from their temple service. They weren't going to the place to serve. Being ceremonially unclean wasn't the issue. Because being unclean and serving in the priestly role would have been a problem. But they weren't going to serve in the temple. They were headed home. They were on their commute home from work. They were finished with their duties, therefore worrying about their cleanliness. In this case, worrying that he may have been dead was not actually something that would hold water. Derek Heisinger wrote, I think it was Derek, because I know Derek and his writing style, in devotions this week, he wrote something on this that I thought was fascinating. He talked about the legal written Torah, the, the law of God, but he also talked about the oral tradition, this tradition of sharing the stories of God and the law faithfully. Big part of Hebrew culture, big part of the early part of scripture. It was all narrative-based. You gotta think, way back when, there wasn't much writing So it was all the telling of the story. It was the telling of the story of God's faithfulness. The oral tradition would have been known to all the priests and the Levites. The oral tradition was held on equal standing with the written Torah. They would have known this. And Jesus does something in this that is really interesting. Because the oral tradition in this says that every law in the Torah, the law of God... Every law can be broken and no expense should be spared if a life can be saved or extended. And they would have known that. And Jesus knows that the priest and Levite would have known that. And Jesus knows that the expert in the law, the rich young ruler, would have also known this. He's implying that there is absolutely no love of God and love of neighbor in this action of keeping themselves clean by not getting dirty with someone in need, not helping out. And I love that about Jesus. He knows the nuance of the law, and he says, yeah, you follow the letter of it, but you miss the spirit of the law. And when we realize that these men were actually avoiding the high call of God to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with him, that they actually find themselves not only not loving the person, but being more distant from God. Their hearts are cold to what God loves. Let's look at Martha. Kind of the tail end of our scripture today has a story of these two sisters, Mary and Martha. And these two sisters are hosting Jesus, but only one of them's doing the work. We all have that one sibling, right? Just a word of warning, I was that sibling, and my brother Lincoln would be like, preach all day, like I could get out of work when I was little. I was gifted at it. And, and Mary and Martha have this situation where something's going on where there's a cultural A student. Martha was the cultural A student. She was hosting a well-known and renowned teacher in her home. And what do you do when the, when the good people come over, right? You don't eat off Chinette on those, right? Like you get out the good stuff. You break out the porcelain, you break out the best that you have and you work hard to make your home, the meal and everything ready to receive them well. We know this, we've all had company, we've had people over and you really go out of your way. And then when it's somebody important like Jesus, she was going all out. Martha was going all out. And she was doing what was right culturally because women in this day and age were not allowed to sit and be part of the discussion. Don't be mad at me. I didn't make the rules. But back in the first century, the women would have been preparing the food and serving and caring for everything else while the men sat with the teacher and they discussed things. Women would not have been educated in this day and age unless the husband chose to have them educated. And if he did, it would have only been within the home. So you can see like Martha is living perfectly into the cultural image of loving God. She is serving, making sure Jesus has food. It seems perfectly logical. Perfectly logical in this. 
The women were to be busy with the preparations and serving. Martha was doing fantastic when she looked at that. If that was the rubric by which she was being graded, she was fantastic. Obeying the cultural rules of the day, she was working hard and fully engaged, but she was missing out on spending time with Jesus. And I think that's what we really need to understand is all these cultural A students missed the one thing that mattered most. See... The students showed real love, but they, they failed. The ones who experienced and showed real love failed the culture test. They weren't good students of the law, but they somehow fulfilled it in their actions. We need to understand something, and we'll look first at the Samaritans, and then we'll take a look at the story of Mary and Martha. When we talk about Samaritans, there's not really a cultural equivalent for us, especially in a politically correct day and age where you have a people group you don't like. That's not cool, right? It's not good. But I will tell you this, it was a fact of reality for most of the world up till the last number of years where we have said no more, like we are stamping out racism, right? We hate that. But back in this day and age, it was common. And Samaritans were hated like we despise terrorists. They were hated by Jewish people. There was a long history of brokenness between Hebrews and the Samaritans, because Samaritans used to be Hebrews, and a bunch of history we can't unpack. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And Jesus knows that when he makes a Samaritan the good guy in a story, that goes over terribly in terms of cultural appropriateness. No one would have thought this was okay. Nowadays, we have a cultural understanding. We call people good Samaritans, and it's like a little compliment. Why aren't you a good Samaritan? Yeah, in this, in that day and age, it would have been like saying a good terrorist. you are like, well, well, that doesn't make sense. There isn't one, right? You wouldn't think there was a good terrorist, but Jesus was saying that this is what it is. This is the person who actually had it right, so he, um, so there's a couple of things that show us that this good Samaritan was better than the priest and the Levite in showing love to God and neighbor. First thing is this. He wouldn't have known whether the person who had been robbed was a Hebrew or a Samaritan. He only cared that a human was in crisis because the man would have been what? Beaten, bloodied, and, and naked. He got his clothes beaten off him. Right, So they they had stripped him. There was no cultural identifiers on him to say who he was. We just know this, that this man saw a wounded person and he went and crossed over to him. He went to him. And when he got to him, he didn't know whether he was Jewish or Samaritan. Neighbor isn't easily defined. You can see the the nuance of Jesus' answer to this rich young, young ruler. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus is saying, Everyone, everyone. What is exceptional in this, in in Jesus' use of a Samaritan, is that he is not only the hero of the story, but he becomes what's right in the story. He becomes this thing that is the correct way to live out Torah, the law of God, the love of God as expressed in the law. And and we, we look at him and we don't realize how quickly Jews would have dismissed a Samaritan. He can't be the hero of the story. He's only the bad guy, but he's the hero in it. He's the one that showed the love and kindness of God that God called his people to show to the world. It would have been mind-boggling. It would have made no sense to his, ob- uh, to his audience. And we know this, the, Mer- the Samaritan failed the acceptance and cultural quiz, but he pleased God. The Samaritan failed the acceptance and culture quiz. He did everything that people thought would not happen because he's a bad guy, right? But he pleased God. He wasn't the cultural A student, but he pleased God. And there's something for us in that. He noticed, he stopped, and he cared. He dirtied and spent himself on behalf of a stranger, or as we could call it, a neighbor. A neighbor. He busied, cared, and spent himself on another. Mercy loves without measuring. And if you doubt that, read the story of Jesus. Mercy loves without measurement. It just loves lavishly and at great expense. And then you have Mary. You have Mary, this next story. 
She should have culturally been busy with Martha. She should have been hard at work in the kitchen making sure Jesus, the disciples, and the rest of the men had something to eat. She was doing the wrong thing culturally. By sitting at the feet of Jesus, she was interrupting the cultural right thing to do. Notice, she doesn't just sit in the room. She sits like right under him. She's right there. So if anybody's looking at Jesus, they also see Mary. She bucked cultural norms because she loved Jesus. She was bucking against cultural norms and didn't worry about what other people thought. How many of us are captive to that? I mean, Mark Zuckerberg knows that if we get a like on Facebook, there's a release of dopamine. And we're actually addicted to that little thing of what? Of being liked by caring about what people think. We know that we're addicted to this, but Mary bucked cultural norms to do one thing, to be in love with Jesus. And in the end, we find that by not worrying about what people thought, she actually did what was right. She loved Jesus regardless of what was culturally expected. And I think you and I are called to the same thing. In the scripture in Luke 10, 27, it says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I wanna, I, I wanna end this with a very clear kind of pushback to us. Don't tell me why you're justified in not loving someone. Don't tell me if everyone else agrees with you. It matters that much. You need to make sure that the way you care for every person on this earth, remember, every person bears the image of God. They're created in his image. Whether they're a cultural good guy or a cultural bad guy, Jesus Christ died to save them. And we are called to love our neighbor without measurement. We are called to love and show mercy without measurement. If you find yourself trying to check a box to please God, I can guarantee you this, it's not pleasing. It's not pleasing. Any more than if I walked up to Eric, I'm like, here is your Valentine's card, some roses, and chocolates. It'd be weird. It'd be weird, but it's expected, right? He'd be like, yeah, Eric did great. I saw him at the store with card, flowers, and chocolate. Dude's a champ, right? But if I'm just doing it because I have to, then I'm missing the point of being in love. Being in relationship, we have to understand that we can't check a box to prove that we love God, that we love our neighbor. Don't miss the point in what we're doing here. And the point of all of this is that the way we love God is by a relationship with him, walking closely with him, knowing him in order that by loving him we make him known. That's what these two two stories talk about. The great divider that pulls these, the great divider that keeps these two stories in tension is actually the one thing that um, holds them together. I think it's so unique that the the story of um, the the Good Samaritan and Mary and Martha is right there. One's working, you know, doing the right thing and working hard, and the Good Samaritan, the other, is this this woman who's working hard and doing the wrong thing. So hard work isn't the answer. What is it? Loving God, loving Jesus, that's what Mary did. And loving neighbor, that's what the Good Samaritan did. Loving them more than they love themselves. That is your call, that is my call. We're not excused or justified, even if culture agrees, in who we think is, a, is below our service. Everyone, everyone is our neighbor. And we are to love God and show it quite often by loving those around us. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we thank you for who you are, for the things that you're doing in our life to convict us and transform us. So we pray that today we would not be owned by our sin or the brokenness of our own um, prejudices. We don't like to use words like that, but Lord, there are people we feel aren't worthy of our love, but you disagree. So we ask as we try to love you, may we show it through the way we love our neighbors. Love the world around us in service, but not as a checkbox, in relationship. May we be people, students of your word, and also connected deeply in the life and community of your church and the world around us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. 
If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.